hyperbolic groups um, and some other examples of groups. And um, so So I kind of want to do two things. One, I want to talk about extending the results, or yeah, you know, as, as sort of stated, and, and uh, the of this sort of conjecture. And then I want to talk about a variation where one considers stable commutator length not the random words of length n, but of the result of a random walk of length n. It's a, it's a slightly different notion, um, but it's it's related. But it has slightly different kinds of properties with respect to um, sort of functoriality. Um, OK, anyway, so, so let G be a hyperbolic group. And S a finite generating set. Um, if you like, you can make it symmetric. In any case, I want to think of it as generating G as a semi group, just for convenience. So, if we want to talk about the idea of a random word of length n in the hyperbolic group with respect to word length in the generating set, or well, we can define that to find that set, give it the uniform measure, pick an element random. But it's hard to prove anything about um, such an element from that description because it's a very um, complicated process by which one actually generates such a random element. And for example, look at its process properties. So the very nice thing about hyperbolic groups is that um, it turns out that there is a way to generate a random element of a hyperbolic group by a Markov process, just as uh, in a free group, uh, you know, some rank would say, you know, finite symmetric generating set. There was a nice way of generating a random reduced word of length n by picking a letter, running it down, picking another letter at random subject to the fact that it doesn't, doesn't cancel a previous letter, writing it down, and so on and so forth. There's this very simple process of generating a random word of length n, or a random word of, you know, potential uh, of, 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 of to be prescribed length. So it has this sort of Markov property. Um, so the key sort of point is that there's a similar pr procedure for, for generating a random element of a hyperbolic group. So this is sort of a well-known story, um, and I'm going to uh, summarize it uh, quite quite quickly, but try to explain sort of somehow what the, the salient points is points are. So so basically depends on the following observation. It's not, it's not hard to prove, but it was a kind of really remarkable observation by Cannon, that's a bit unreadable, Cannon, which, which is the following. So if G is hyperbolic, S is a finite generating set. Um, so let's uh, pick uh, an order, total order on S, and we have an induced dictionary order on S star, meaning words of arbitrary finite length in the alphabet S, um, then with respect to this dictionary order, the language of, you know, for concreteness, um, lexicographically first, G of E6 is regular. I'm not going to give an abstract definition of what regular means, but I'm going to quickly say what this, how to translate this into, into some procedure that we, we can, kind of can, can use. So, i.e., um, there exists a finite directed graph, gamma, with some initial state. Or some special vertex, um, edge, edges labeled by L1 
elements of S in such a way that there is at most one outgoing edge from each vertex with a given label. And with the following property, um, so I guess I'll draw it over here. So we look at the set of finite directed paths in gamma. Well, actually, in fact, let's say directed paths in gamma of length 10 starting at this sort of initial vertex. We're given such a path, we read the edge labels, and we get a word in the alphabet S star. So read the edge labels. <coughs> well, we get uh, words of length N in some very specific uh, regular language L star. and then given such a word we evaluate it right, give a word in S star is an element in the group, we evaluate it an element of the group and what we get here are well, a priori there are elements of word length at most n, it turns out they're going to be elements of word, of word length exactly n so in fact these are going to be elements of g of length, word length, exactly n. And the point is that both of these maps here should be bijections. Okay, so if you like, the rule, you can ignore the bit in the middle and just say this map here is a bijection. Every element of G, uh, of word length M, corresponds in a unique way to a directed path of length M in this finite graph starting at the initial vertex. Conversely, a finite directed path in this graph starting at the initial vertex corresponds to an uh, element of G of word length M. In fact, it gives you a specific geodesic representative and the way it does it is take the path and read the edge labels that gives you the word. That word is the lexicographically first geodesic uh, representative of the given element in, in G. So this is the meaning of Cannon's theorem for our purposes. And so with this sort of setup, it's kind of um, reasonably, well, it's not, it's not completely clear, but it, this suggests that um, how we might go about uh, enumerating uh, or picking a random element of G of length M, all we need to do is uh, take a random directed walk on this uh, directed graph starting the initial vertex of length M. Well, to say what we mean by a random, a random walk, each step, of course, will just go along some edge, some directed edge, which is outgoing from the given vertex that we're at. But to decide what we mean by random, we want this to be a Markov process where the states of the Markov process are the vertices in the graph. We need to say what the edge probabilities are. So we need to choose uh, probabilities on the edges um, in such a way uh, that I'll just say random uh, path of length n corresponds to random element of word length n. Well, you can't quite do this exactly, but you can sort of do it um, coarsely speaking. What, you, what, that, what that means is there is in fact a way to assign probabilities to edges in such a way that a random path, the set of you know, guys here, a random path of length n, you push it forward, that gives you a probability measure on 
the set of words of length n, you can arrange that no element gets too big a probability and that every element is within a bounded distance of something with a positive, with a definite probability. Right? So some elements might get, might get probability zero in this, in this way of assigning, assigning probabilities here. But everything will be within, say, distance 17 of something whose probability is at least you know, uh, a third of whatever the maximum is. And, and yeah, no element is, has more than three times whatever the minimum is. I don't understand that. If, if you assign positive probabilities to all the edges, that which you do not, which you do not, okay, all right. Why not? So here's why not. Um, here's a graph. Um, you know. Uh, 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 here's a graph. So supposing we assign positive, so supposing, so here's our initial state. We go here, and when we're here, we go to any one of these guys, and then after a while, if we happen to land here, we could decide to go here. Once we're here, we have to just go sort of back and forth. So the point is, once we land here, our future is sort of determined. If we stand, if we if we're here, then we have lots of choices for our future. The set of possible futures grows exponentially fast. So if you just look at the set of all words of length n, basically all of them, almost all of them have the property that they spend all but log n of their time in this component. Once you leave once you leave here, you have you don't you have you don't have many descendants. Right? So if you look at all the people who are alive in the world, most of them are the children of people who had lots who had big families. Right? It doesn't mean that most people have big families. Actually, this is sort of an interesting paradox. Most people have families, um, most people have fewer children than the size of the household they grew up in. This is not a paradox, it's just that uh, you know, the few people who do have lots of children tend to produce most of the next generation of children. Right? So, so most words of length n spend all of it log n of their time in this big component here. So if you give this edge any positive probability, right, then, then, then you're going to be, if you have a word of length n, after some bounded amount of time, it's got a definite chance of going here. When really you want it to spend essentially all its time here. So you better give this edge probability zero. I mean that's just life. Um, actually, but this is this is this is great because it, it exactly illustrates exactly the next thing I was going to talk about. So we have a graph gamma. We can associate to that a nice matrix, which is just the adjacency matrix. But this is a directed graph, so this has um, uh, m i j is one if there's a directed edge from i to j. And if there's several, you count the number of them. Well, okay, that's the whole definition. Zero, if not. Uh, but in general, just is this the number of direct images from IJ? Let's put it like that. So this is not a symmetric matrix, but it is a non-negative matrix. And so parent Fabinius theory tells you it has sort of a maximum eigenvalue. <laughs> maximum eigenvalue. Uh, it's real. Uh, has a non-negative uh, positive, uh, a non-negative uh, right eigen, eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda, non-negative left eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. So as a maximum eigenvalue, there are all the other eigenvalues are strictly are less than or equal to an absolute value. There might happen to be some which are, are equal, actually, and 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 uh, uh, this is sort of because this is not a strictly positive matrix. But anyway, there's some maximal eigenvalue, and this maximal eigenvalue is the growth rate of uh, words. Well, to be a little bit careful. Um, this has the property that the number of 
Uh, I'm just going to write this for a number of paths of length n is lambda b n times some polynomial in f. It's order factor. Okay. And the degree of the polynomial um, minus so the degree of the polynomial uh, plus one is basically the dimension of the biggest Jordan block um, in this eigenvalue uh, with eigenvalue lambda. So I'll just say that degree of p uh, plus one is dimension of the maximal lambda, 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 one, 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 block. If you like, degree of p is the number of ones in the block. So, you know, most symmetric matrix might have um, Jordan blocks, which are sort of a bit bigger, and so the degree of this polynomial might be bigger than one. Um, here's a fact. Theorem to So this is for any direct, any 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 uh, direct example. Fact to Kernier, um, if we have hyperbolic group, then the graph that we construct this way has a special property: um, uh, degree of p equals zero. In other words, all the Jordan blocks with this maximal eigenvalue are in fact uh, size one. So the, the lambda eigenspace. Generalized eigenspace is a, is, a, is a genuine eigenspace. So the actual growth is lambda to the n times, times a, up to a multiplicative constant. OK, that actually has some consequences for the structure of this directed graph. And then there's a very, very important uh, consequences. So we can define an equivalence relation. We have a directed graph. We can define an equivalence relation. Oh, very good question. Um, yes. The image is not symmetric. Yes. What makes eigenvalues still real? Sorry? Makes eigenvalues still real? No. Not all the eigenvalues are real. Oh, I see. But the, the maximum eigenvalue? There, there is a real eigenvalue, which is positive, and its absolute value is at least as big as the absolute value of every else. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. If you know Heron Frobenius theorem, just sort of take a limit as some entries go to zero. Yeah. And then strict inequalities become not strict. So define an equivalence relation on the states, which is to say the, the vertices of gamma, by saying that I twiddle j if there is a directed path from I to j and a directed path from j to I. So, People often say that these are communicating classes. So this is, uh, if you like, a directed graph. Now the word for that is it's a topological Markov chain, and these are communicating classes in the topological Markov chain. Okay, so you can define a new graph. We can define a new graph, a new directed graph, whose vertices are the equivalence classes. the old vertices. Whichever equivalence class gets the initial vertex, that's the equivalence. That's the, that's the, um, that's the initial vertex in the new graph. Um, it's probably safe to have nothing coming into the initial vertex, so that gets its own equivalence class. So we get, if we did that to this graph here, um, here's one equivalence class. Here's another equivalence class. Here's a third equivalence class. So the new graph we get look a little bit uninteresting, basically just looks like this. And if you want to kind of emphasize that there's things you can do in this, you can kind of draw something like that. But that's not, that's not such a bad idea. Let's just do this. So let's just really emphasize that the resulting graph has no loops. Because if there were a loop here, what would it mean? Would mean that there are a pair of communicating classes where there's a path from a guy here to a guy here, and a path from some guy, another, possibly a different guy here to a different guy here. But then you can join those up using a communicating property within the classes to get a loop, proving that these two, you know, proving that these two elements that you thought were not communicating were in fact communicating. Okay. So the point is, once we kind of quotient out 
by you know every loop quotients to a point, uh, the resulting directed graph has no loops. That's one way of okay, so the vertices of this new graph we're going to call the components of the old graph. So these are the components of gamma. And now each component C gets um, its own adjacency matrix. Right? Now, the nice thing about this is that the adjacency matrix of a component has the following property. For every i and j, there's a power of the matrix such that the ij entry is non-zero. It's positive, in fact. So this is sometimes called ergodicity. Well, yeah. Anyway, it's sometimes called ergodicity. I just call it ergodicity. Each component C gets MC. Sometimes ergodicity you want to... So, so the, the point is, MC itself, it may not have a power in which every entry is positive, but for every entry there's a power such that it's positive. And so what this means, in fact, is that the biggest eigenvalue, the Jordan blocks, all have size 1. Now, there might happen to be other eigenvalues um, which are equal to the biggest eigenvalue times the root of unity. And you can kind of ignore that. Basically, it, just mean, it would mean, for instance, um, supposing the uh, greatest common divisor of the lengths of all loops was bigger than 1. Well, then they would sort of like, you could, you could color the vertices with different colors in such a way that um, uh, every walk of length you know, n went from a vertex of the same color. To get preserved, preserved colors or something. Anyway, so let's, let's sort of ignore the sort of issue of periodicity or otherwise, but each component C gets an MC, and each MC has its own maximum eigenvalue lambda C, and in fact the Jordan block here is, is um, uh, just sort of, sort of size 1, and a Jordan block of size uh, P, uh, P plus 1, corresponds to a consecutive string of components for which lambda c equals lambda. So Cornell's theorem, Cornell's theorem about the rate of growth of elements in a hyperbolic group implies that components for which lambda c equals lambda, maybe, they can, maybe there are several of them, but they, can't, they, they can occur in parallel, but they can't occur in series. So I'm going to call a component big, if lambda c equals lambda. Okay, so c is big if lambda c equals lambda. By the way, lambda is equal to the maximum over c of lambda sub c. Right? So at least there's at least one big component, and possibly several. And Cunet's theorem says that big components can occur um, possibly in parallel, but not in, not in series. So maybe I should sort of say that. Uh, yeah. Say so this implies big components can occur in parallel, meaning, roughly speaking, here could be one big component, here could be another, here could be a third, but not in series. You can't have a big component followed by another big component. This kind of So in fact, if we want to look at the structure of this graph, well, as I said, in this particular example we drew here, if you look at all blocks of length, you know, a billion, then almost all of them, extremely high probability, they spend all their time in here except for possibly length, length log a billion. And in fact, the same is true in general. If you look at almost all walks of length n, they spend basically all their time, except possibly for a prefix and a suffix of length log n, in a maximal component. And because maximal components can't occur in series, by this theorem of Kronair, that means that almost every word of length n spends almost all its time, except for a prefix of length log n and a suffix of length log n, in a single maximal component. So if you actually want to know what the correct edge of weights to put on the edges, basically you might have some probability on you know, edges leading into a big component, um, depending on how likely you are to enter that big component, but you have no probability on edges leading out. 
So this is just a sort of dilemma or observation among the crew that's stated. Uh, all but exponentially few words I, or, or parts of length n spend all but log n um, prefix and suffix of their time in a single big component. It'll be different for different words, but that's, that's what the way it is. So schematically speaking, here's the initial vertex. You have finitely many big components. We kind of have some sort of tails coming up here. Um, almost all the words spend sort of log n time going on one of these parts, then they spend n, you know, minus 2 log n, I guess, or whatever, time here, and they might spend log n at the end. We kind of just ignore the suffix and the prefix. Things on the scale log n are kind of uninteresting to us. So basically, the word chooses, very quickly chooses a big component, goes there, and then stays there. So you just have a bunch of probabilities, P1, P2, P3, which are just the probabilities of entering a big component. Since you do it at the start, these are just some fixed probabilities. Having then entered a big component, a random walk thereafter is just uh, generated by an ergodic Markov process. Okay. And that's nice because there are a lot of theorems for ergodic Markov chains we have. Near more of large numbers, central limit theorems, and so on and so forth. So, for instance, um, the lemma we proved yesterday that said if we had a random word in a free group of length n, and we had uh, we looked at subwords of length uh, l, which was strictly less than this critical length scale, then the words were extremely well equidistributed. A similar thing holds uh, for each of these big components. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I mean that, um, so first of all, we have to decide what the length scale is. So the length scale is uh, log now to the base lambda of n. Right, log n over log. Right, this is the, you know, uh, this is the growth rate of the Markov process. The rate, 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 rate which is generating words is, is, is uh, lambda. Roughly lambda times as many words of length three as there are of length two, well, of length a billion as there are of length a billion minus one. So m is m is this, and this length scale, we fix some L less than one, we define capital L the little L M. We look at the set, I'll call it S star capital L, of possible strings. of length um, uh, uh, L, then each component C determines a measure, probability measure, mu C, probability measure on uh, this set. I mean, it's a finite set. It's just a bunch of weights telling you how often, if an arbitrarily long were conditioned to be in a component C, how many of their subwords are uh, this particular guy here. So to get them some probability measure mu sub C, and then we have um, uh, lemma. Um, the number of subwords, we could pick any such, any set for any, so for all sigma in S star L, the number of copies of uh, this particular sigma in some W um, minus uh, M mu C sigma is um, less than or equal to, well, M mu C sigma to half plus epsilon, basically. Um, the probability that this holds, um, I'll just say conditioned on W entering the component C is like this. And this is a constant C. So what, this, what does this say? This says, if you have a word W, well, it chooses one of these big components to go into. 
So supposing it goes into this big component C. Okay, so it spends log, log n time here, we can ignore that. Then it enters C, spends basically time n here, and then maybe log n time at the end. We ignore the log n time at the start of the end, and then we contribute it most like a constant. Okay. So we enter, we enter this guy here, um, and then we immediately spend uh, time n in an ergodic Markov chain. So in an ergodic Markov chain, we spend an infinite amount of time there. There will be some average amount of time that we saw um, the, 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 the word sigma appear as a subword. That's what this mu c sub sigma is. So what this says is that if we spend time n there, then if we look at how many words w there are, how many words, how many times sigma occurs in w, and compare it with the expected value. It's very close to the expected value. The, the difference is basically the square root, very, very small compared to the expected value, um, with very, very high probability. The problem is, yes. Does that say two plus epsilon? Yeah. The a half plus, to the power of a half plus epsilon. A half plus epsilon. It's, it's basically the error is going to be like like a Gaussian times the square root of, of this, which means that if you take any power bigger than a half, it's going to be much smaller than that. Yeah. So you can say a lot about. In fact, the error is in fact this essential limit theorem which describes the. But in any case, this is, yeah. So this is basically just the trade-off now. Exactly the same proof before, right? Just look at the subwords starting on uh, uh, a, a letter which is whose residue is i mod some big uh, constant n times n, and those guys are almost extremely independent. So we get a trade-off bound for those. There are only you know log n odd residues to consider, so uh, we can add up all these all these kind of you know treat these subwords as though they were. In Okay, this is good, this is real progress. The problem is, we don't know what this measure mu c is. It might just happen, well, we might be thinking to ourselves, we would like sigma and sigma inverse to appear roughly equal so that we can pair, pair them and build a, build a commutator. The problem is, there's just no reason for that to, to occur. It might happen that, that, you know, for whatever reason, the way we built our directed graph, um, the word a can, you know, a, 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 there's a loop where all whose labels are a, and it just happens not to be a loop all of whose labels are a inverse in this particular component. So we could build big powers of a, and big powers of a will occur with definite frequency, but big powers of a inverse just won't occur at all. That could happen. And we're sort of stuck at this point because, well, we just have these different components, and we don't know what the relative proportions are, Something might happen here, something might happen here, something might happen here. So there's a nice trick which, which Koji, Koji Rora and I observed, which actually lets you compare what goes on in different components. So the point is, our Markov chain is not ergodic. If it was a if it were ergodic, that would mean that there's essentially just one big component. I'm not saying it's not ergodic. But what is ergodic is the action of the group on the boundary of the group. There's, there's a group here. This is not just a semi-group or a set or something. It's secretly a group. We haven't really used the group, the multiplication of the group, anywhere. So let's actually look at a group. And so let's suppose we have you know, three components, C1, C2, C3, something like this. Some finite list of big components. And so basically, you can break up the group into pieces depending, corresponding to the words, which correspond to paths, which spend most of their time in the components C1, C2, C3. So these C1 words, the C2 words, and the C3 words. OK? So Let's look at a typical C1 word. So here's a typical C1 word. Gamma sub 1. So this is a typical C1 word. So what does that mean? It means if you look at the set of subwords of length, so it means if we look at the set of subwords of length, uh, uh, then mu L sigma of them are sigma, meaning 
just count them one by one, you look at you know, how many of them are sigma, and you look at, in the, in the limit, the relative proportion of them. So that, that limit exists, almost surely, and again, it's almost surely equal to this specific limit, mu L of sigma. So almost all points in the boundary infinity uh, correspond to paths um, which are typical in this sense. By the way, this map from, there's a sort of map from not just finite paths to elements of the group, but from infinite paths to elements of the boundary. Because an infinite path gives you a geodesic ray in the group that hits some definite point in the sphere of infinity. Now this map is not one to one, but it is onto and it is finite to one. So given a point in infinity, up to a finite ambiguity can reconstruct the infinite path in uh, gamma corresponding to that. So it makes sense to talk about you know, a point in the boundary corresponding to a typical path or not. So we have a typical path, and we know we can read off this probability, um, this is mu c. We can read off this probability measure just from almost any path. We have almost any path available to us that basically determines this probability measure. We can just read that, read that off. Well, what we do, let's hit this path on the left with an element of the group in such a way that, um, so this is now, I don't know, G or something. This is G gamma. We hit this path on the left with an element of the group in such a way that the end point of it, which was in, say, boundary 1, <coughs> has now mapped into boundary 2. Why can we do this? Well, this is just some point in the boundary. And the action of the group G on its boundary is ergodic. You have to say what you mean, what measure you mean when you talk about ergodic. Well, you have a measure on paths, you have a measure on infinite paths, set of infinite paths is a nice measure, just push it forward to this measure on the boundary. That, that's a very standard thing, it's called a patterson sullivan measure. And it's a theorem, true, just, just, just as true in hyperbolic groups as it is for climbing groups, that the action of the group G on its boundary is ergodic with respect to the patterson sullivan measure. Basically, the patterson sullivan measure is proportional to the Hausdorff measure you know, in a certain kind of metric, and therefore it has to be uh, ergodic. Um, so, so, so what does this mean? It means you can get this endpoint and map it into this endpoint, map it, map it into some different region here. In fact, we can map this different region in such a way that there's some gamma 2 with the same endpoint, such that gamma 2 is a typical C2 word. But now these are two G D C rays. Their endpoints are different, but they end at the same point in infinity. So outside some compact region, they follow a travel. And that means that the subwords of length L here and the subwords of length L here correspond approximately. Co approximately correspond. So there's a kind of convolution, if you like. Um, and we call it sort of new C. C prime, and the way the formula doesn't really make sense, I'm going to say mu C convolved with this equals mu C prime. What do I mean by that? There's a rule, mu C, which takes, so this is sort of a function, if you like, from um, S star L to probability measures on S star L. Uh, with the following thing. So if I take, if I take a, um, yeah, so, so then it makes sense to convolve this. Right? So I have a probability measure and I convolve the function from elements of S to probability measures, I get a probability measure. Okay, so it says, I take something, uh, I take a, I take a whatever length L with whatever probability, some specific guy, I take that specific guy, I apply this to it, I get uh, another guy with some distribution and that, that tells me the target, sort of randomly speaking. And I sort of integrate over all possible guys, and that gives me a map from measures to measures. Okay. And this has the crucial property that mu c, c prime of any word sigma is always equal to the support of this. There's a measure. So the support of this is um, consists of words 
of the form G1 sigma G2, where the length of G1 and G2 is bounded by a constant. Basically, you know, delta, two delta. Uh, let's just back call it like two delta. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that the measures mu c and mu c prime are not exactly the same, but they're almost the same. Basically, the measure mu c prime is obtained by smearing out mu c a little bit by taking every word in mu c and replacing it by a collection of words which differ from that word only by multiplying it on the left or the right or both by a small word. So if you consider words up to sort of the ambiguity of being multiplied on the left and the right by words of a bounded size, up to that ambiguity, mu c and mu c prime are the same. Okay? That's true for any pair. There are, finite, there are finitely many. So that says all the mu c are basically the same, up to this sort of finite ambiguity. All the mu c are basically the same. Well, that's good because, that's good because, if we look at all the words of length L, then G inverse appears as often as G, well, once. So what that means is that if all the mu's together, we add up all the mu's together, that's something which is a quarter of S star L. Maybe it's not symmetric there, but its image in G is symmetric because its image in G is just the set of all words of length L. Right? So, in particular, it implies that each mu c is approximately symmetric in the sense that sigma and sigma inverse appear approximately the same amount. Well, not quite. We can choose a sort of map, again, a sort of probabilistic map from SC star L to itself, such that every word sigma is sort of paired with another word which is not quite sigma inverse, but differs from it by multiplication on the left and the right by a short word. And we can do this basically eating up all the probability in, it, in a kind of uniform way. So I'll just sort of say we can pair sigma with some sigma prime, which is equal to g sigma inverse uh, g2. And these two are both short. We could pair these sort of, sort of probabilistically in such a way that it takes the measure to itself. Okay? And what that means is that if we have a random word of length n, and we know that the distribution of the subwords of length L is very close to this measure mu c, then we compare the subwords of this specific word L in such a way that each subword is paired with a different word which differs from its inverse only by a little multiplication of the left and the right. Okay? And we know that, well, here's our big word W of length N. We've got all of these subwords of length L. In fact, we could just write, in fact, the ones that just occur in, in you know, consecutive ones. Each one can be paired with some other one, which is almost equal to the inverse of it. We can cancel these at the cost of a commutator and be left with so something of size 1 over log n at the end. So that sort of says that the commutator length, that commutator length of L is W is less than or equal to uh, order n over log n with very high probability. Okay. Getting the lower bound is a lot easier. Basically, getting the lower bound just amounts to saying, well, um, how would I have a very, very low stable commutator length? There would have to be a pair of subwords which were approximately inverse and extremely long. And when well, we just look at what can happen at every point, every single time you add a letter, there's a definite chance of deviating from the, from the particular thing you'd like to be. And so you know, you're, you're exponentially unlikely to be able to, to do that from more than distance log n. Right. So that's, that's, let me just, a little bit happy, but that's, the lower bound is a bit softer. But the other bound requires some more delicate analysis because it really uses um, this, this sort of Chernoff type inequality. This is, this is a very, you know, very, uh, it's not hard, but it's a, it's a very 
uh, uh, powerful inequality. We really, really need that to get the upper bound, the lower bound as much. Also. All right, so that's random words in hyperbolic groups. There's another sense of random that I do want to talk about because I think it's kind of very interesting. Say some things about it, which is, by the way, I think I mentioned in words at the start, maybe I didn't, everything I'm talking about today is joint work with Joseph Mai. Um, okay, so now, let's look at random walks. So now, let's again look at the case of the free group. We have a random walk on a free group. So this with a, with a symmetric generating set. Symmetric. Symmetric free generating set. And so a random walk, you just apply each element of the generating set successively and don't worry about whether they cancel or not. So this is not just a Markov process. The, succe the successive products are literally just independent. So this is an extremely simple kind of random process here, which we're going to say a lot about. Well, okay, so for hyperbolic groups in general, one can talk about random words, and one can talk about random blocks, and these two concepts of random tend to be very singular with respect to each other. For the free group, because the free group just happens to be so symmetric, symmetric with respect to this free generating state, it happens to be just so symmetric, um, it turns out that random walk and random words are essentially the same up to a rescaling. Okay, so the point is the Cayley graph here Cayley graph here, I guess I'm supposed assuming it has rank two, but anyway, the Cayley graph here, the group of symmetries of this graph, which say fix the origin, is transitive on the sphere of any given radius. So if you have two um, radially symmetric random processes, the only difference that they can have is how they differ in terms of radial, their radial thing. They have to be, they have to be the distribution has to be symmetric with respect to you know these these, these all symmetries which which fix the origin. So so the uh, probabilities are constant on the spheres of some radius. So if you look at a random word of length n, well, that's just concentrated on the sphere of radius n. It's a kind of direct measure sort of on that sphere. Everything gets equal measure. If you look at a random walk of length n, it's sort of, um, it kind of, it's supported, I'm going to draw it sort of as a, I mean, just sort of, here's, here's radius. So the random, random word is just sort of, this is random word. It just has a one at n. Random walk is kind of like a bump like this. But actually, it turns out to be a very, very thin bump. Basically, the width of it is like log n. And the uh, length of it is the square root of n. Um, and and uh, it's peaked, um, not at n, but at n uh, 2k minus 2 over 2k. And the reason for this is that if you think of how far you are away from the origin, well, unless you're literally at the origin, that just looks like a biased random walk. Right? At every point, no matter where you are, providing it's not the origin, you have 2k minus 1 chances of increasing the distance from the origin by 1, and 1 chance of decreasing the distance from the origin by 1. So you, on average, move away from the origin of 2k minus 2 over 2k uh, steps with each step, and then your deviation from that is basically just a, an ordinary unbiased random walk. So you're going to go exactly distance n, 2k minus 2 over 2k, with error order root n. So if you think about it, a random walk of length n is basically just a convolution of random words of length, you know, things in this interval weighted by this amount. And since we know exactly what the stable commutator length is for a random word, we know exactly what the stable commutator length is for a random walk. So um, probably uh, stable commutator length, probability that the stable commutator length of, this is now random walk, of length n, 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 even, uh, uh, it's going to be well, n over log, uh, wait, uh, 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 
So we had um, log 2k minus 1 over 6. We need to multiply that by <coughs> 2k minus 2 over 2k. Doesn't matter what it is. It points to an explicit constant. Anyway, probability that this is bigger than uh, it's less than epsilon is. So we know exactly this perfect concentration of stable commutator length under a random walk on a free group of length tau. Supposing I have a homomorphism from a group, a free group, to another group. Random walk on my free group pushes forward to random walk on my target group with respect to the generators on the target group, which are just the image of my generators, my free group. So that says that if I have any group and random walk generated by, you know, say a finite set of elements, random walk with respect to that generating set with equal weights is the image, let's suppose it's symmetric, is the image of random walk on a free group with a symmetric generating set under a homomorphism. Under homomorphism, stable commutator length can't go up, it can only go down. Or, or stay the same. So as a corollary, let's have GB any group with a finite symmetric generating set S. Let's let GN be a random walk of length N. And let's look at the stable commutator length of this compared to, um, uh, yeah, so this thing here, let me just say, this thing here is going to be less than or equal to uh, 2k minus 2 over 2k uh, with k generators, or 2k symmetric generators. Uh, log 2k minus 1 over 6 plus epsilon So we get upper bound for a random walk uh, in any group. With any group with any symmetric generating set, look at symmetric random walk with respect to that generating set, run it for time n, the universal upper bound, explicit constant for the universal upper bound. Um, I think it'd be kind of interesting to characterize exactly when equality is achieved. I imagine it probably characterizes free groups. I guess I don't know that for a fact, but that's, that'd be my guess. You might worry a little bit that we have the condition, of course, on words in the commutator subgroup. And over here, you might have words which are not in the commutator subgroup whose image over there is in the commutator subgroup. But what's true is that if I have a random word here of length n, with very high probability, it's a something in the commutator subgroup times something whose size is small, little o of n over log. In fact, you know, n to the minus k over 2. Right? Um, so in particular, its image is something in the commutator subgroup times something very small. And the thing in the commutator subgroup has SCL satisfying exactly this inequality. Um, so the thing in the target has SCL less than or equal to that, plus a small amount, which is absorbed into epsilon. So this sort of holds for our trick groups with that condition on Well, this is a one-sided bound. Um, so let's say GB hyperbolic. Let me just say, so sort of write it like this. We don't know that C1 and C2 are the same. We don't know that there's a concentration-specific value, but we do know that there are upper and lower bounds on order n over log n with probability 1 minus O, C1 minus N. And in fact, you can be, say something a little bit stronger than that. Uh, we can let S be any, any generating set. Uh, let's, like maybe we have to say symmetric. Uh, symmetric generating set. Not necessarily, doesn't have to, the support doesn't necessarily have to generate G. The support generates a non-elementary subgroup. I think this is right. Anyway, support generating a non-elementary subgroup, we still get the lower bound. And the nice thing about this is that if we have H 
any 2K, sorry, any K generated group, well, H any group, finitely generated group, um, suppose SCL of random, random walk in H of length M, so this is random walk of length M. Supposing this is, supposing this goes slower than N over log M with probability, doesn't even have to be with high probability, but with probability bigger than, you know, exponentially small. It could even hold only for, you know, polynomially few words, but providing it's bigger than just exponentially many. I think this is just has a definite chance of happening. Then any homomorphism from H to any hyperbolic group has elementary image. We can prove similar theorems here for other groups. So G hyperbolic, um, we can also prove this for G uh, mapping class group surface. The mapping class group of a surface, stable commutator length, uh, is between n over log n, constant 1, n over log n, constant 2, n over log n. I don't, I don't think we can, we don't have a proof written for, for, for this, this analogous statement here. Uh, it might be true that there are some non-elementary subgroups, such that blah, 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 but I don't, I don't uh, think we What is that analogous second statement? What, what is the second statement? Which takes out? Uh, you, said, you said you don't have an analogy for which statement. For the hyperbolic group with a generating set, this blah. If the generating set, if the support of the random, if, if it's not a generating set, but merely so, generates some non-elementary non subgroup, I we still have the lower bounds. bounds. Okay. We always have upper bounds. The upper bounds true for any group. The lower bound, we need the subgroup, the support of the, of the generating set. We need the generating set to generate a non-amenable, yeah, a non-elementary subgroup. Here, I don't know if we can remove that. I think, I think if we could remove that, then you could argue similarly any group um, the stable commutator length of a chance of growing smaller than n over log n would have no non-elementary homomorphism to a mapping class group. I believe that's true, but we don't have a proof. And I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I suspect you could replace mapping class group by out fn here. So these are upper bounds. What about lower bounds? Well, there are groups in which stable commutator length vanishes identically. It's pretty easy. So this is groups where the state of commutator length is identically equal to zero. All right, not much to say about that. Um, there also exist groups where state of commutator length of, so this is now always a random walk, is roughly order root n, by which I mean really root n times a Gaussian. And so this is kind of interesting. If you have a group with, um, there's something I completely didn't, didn't say anything about, but there's a sort of a completely dual story to the story of stable commutator length, which is the story of uh, quasi-morphisms and bounded cohomology. And so uh, having non-trivial stable commutator length turns out to be equivalent to the existence of uh, some interesting functions called homogeneous quasi-morphisms. So these are functions a bit like homomorphisms, not exactly. Um, and it's sort of a fact proved by Bjorkland and Hartnick that uh, the values of a quasi-morphism on, on any group, and so sort of quite astonishing generality, um, satisfies central limit theorem with respect to random walk on the group. And so their values are distributed on the set of elements walks of length n, like root n times a Gaussian. And so that provides a lower bound on the value of stable commutator length. So you have a group in which stable commutator length doesn't vanish identically, then it has to go at least like order root n uh, on under random box. So we have this kind of completely general picture that so either stable commutator length could be identically zero, there are examples where it behaves exactly this way. Basically, if the space of quasi-morphisms is finite dimensional, this is, this, is, uh, this is implied, and conjecturally it's equivalent to growth like this. So you could have um, like order root n, you could have n over log n. We know there's nothing above this. We know there's nothing in here. We don't know if there's anything in here. And the question is a question, give any example of a finitely generated group with a finite generating set such that stable commutator length of a random walk, um, not only, maybe not even always is, but just sometimes is 
you know, with, with better than exponential probability, somewhere intermediate between root n and n over log n. So that's 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 it. So